On a Wednesday morning, and we have a, a hero in the studio with us. This is a gentleman named Rocky Sickman. Pleasure to meet you, man. How are you? Mike, I'm awesome. And thank you. I'm not a hero. The heroes are the eight guys that never came home on that rescue operation. Uh, I, I, that's so hard to hear. Uh, but let me explain. Absolutely a hero because I'll tell you why. Same thing I say to firemen. There's no way in the world I'm doing that. There's no like there are things I know in the world I was meant to do and not meant to do, and I was not. I if you if you came to me and said you have to go defend your country, then I would gladly grab a rifle and go do it. But I pray every day that nobody ever asks me to. I'm just there's certain people who are inherently lazy, and I'm that guy. I don't I don't want to be the guy. Have I, you Googled if there's World War Three? What is the cutoff yeah, for the? Yeah, job? yeah, I'm saying I worry about my children, but I know yeah, I'm good for yeah. it. I'm I'm good there. Um, you, you got out of high school and went into the military right after? Yes, sir. 1976, you know, there was no war. It was right after Vietnam. And right. I thought I wanted to see the world. I came from a small town of 50 and that was dogs and cats included. And so I wanted to see the world and the world I saw. And you, and you did, did you think like, uh, like I'll get on a plane after one crashes cause this is when I'm going to crash. Did you feel that way? Were you like, I'm uh, Vietnam lasted it went through the whole thing I, I should be safe here absolutely yeah yeah i thought nothing was going to happen to this little kid from Krakow, missouri wow and and uh first thing you join and then uh how long first of all how was boot camp worse than you thought it was gonna be? you know what i thought i was in shape but little did i realize that the marine corps took you and rebuilt you they yeah. broke down every muscle went to san diego and boot camp uh, my father he cried that morning when i left mike and i never could understand why my father was crying it wasn't until i got in a boot camp that i realized he knew more than i did. <laughs> and uh, i prayed for the next 13 weeks i couldn't wait to get on that airplane but i tell you what because of that boot camp it really helped me make it through the darkest times of my life oh i'm sure i mean they prepare you for those sort of things i mean i i only know what i've seen of boot camp through movies and i don't know how accurate that is but when you watch movies like full metal jacket you yeah. gotta imagine it was probably similar to that oh yes yeah and uh, and then you get in, and what's the first thing they have you doing? Well, um, I become an O three eleven, which is infantry, right. and because I wanted to see the world, so I, I went to three four, which was in Okinawa, uh -huh. Japan. Spent a year in Europe, came back uh, and got connected with two eight in Camp Geiger, North Carolina. Went to Asia, or excuse me, went to Europe, and came back. And then uh, I wanted to be an so you're out, right now. You're getting what you wanted. You got to I see Okinawa. You got to see Europe. You got to see. Uh, you got around. I incredible. And then I wanted to uh, become a Marine security guard, which is a, a very elite duty. You're paid by the Marine Corps, paid by the State Department okay. uh, to protect an American embassy around the world. And where, what embassy did you hope to go for before you ended up in Tehran? Well, I was hoping for Paris. Yeah. Uh, yeah because, yeah. you know, you spend uh, typically three years in a hardship and three years in a good post. Okay. Well, I had just graduated. My parents were there. My girlfriend was there, which just so happened to now be my wonderful wife of 43 Really? Years. After all these years? Good she for you. She waited for me for yeah. 444 days. But uh, um, they had talked about Iran because the American embassy in Iran, Mike, in uh, 19. 79 uh, was attacked and eventually it was closed right and then they reopened it around april of 1979 i get there october 7th now when you hear that uh you're going to iran what do you think that's not probably the part of the world you wanted to see you know mike i was a young naive marine right. uh, 22 years of age and I really didn't know uh, much. Uh, had never really researched Iran. Didn't have time to research because I was on an airplane. And I was over there immediately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you get there, and and uh, what's your what are you what are your duties? What do you have to do right away? Yeah. So as a Marine security guard, your responsibility is to provide protection for the inside parameter, which was, we had a 23 acre compound uh, to protect uh, personnel, property, and documents of the American government. The outside perimeter of the American embassy, Mike, is protected by the host government. Okay. But I can so, tell you that morning, there was no. So the, the uh, Iranian government takes care of the outside and then you take care of the inside. So that day when they wanna let people come in and attack, they just let them come right in. Mike, I will go to my grave uh, if did you see the movie Argo? Uh, yes, yeah. with Ben Affleck. Yes. Yep. And uh, my son was in that movie. I got to speak to the cast, but I didn't know it was being created until halfway through. Uh, but uh, as I told Ben and the staff that morning, November fourth, I'm walking into the motor pool gate, thirty yards away, and all of a sudden, you can hear the demonstration. The demonstration was to demonstrate that Shah of Iran was in the United States for health 
medical. Right. So the Shaw, they kicked the Shaw out, right? Yes. And yeah. then he came over here to get medical uh, yes, treatment, and we accepted him in, even though he had been exiled from Iran. And President Carter, in his staff meeting two weeks prior to letting the Shaw in, that morning the staff said, President Carter, we have to let the Shaw in for medical treatment. And President Carter, it's documented, what are you going to do if I let the Shaw in and our people are taken hostage. Right. He, he, he knew that would weeks. be yeah, an outcome. And why, why was it so important to us that we, that we try? I remember when I was a kid, I remember this happening, but I don't remember the, all the details. Why, why didn't we reject him? Did we bring him in just for humanity reasons or? It was health, health reasons, but there were also, you know, the Shaw was a very wealthy man. Right. And there was a lot of dollars. Uh, uh, <laughs> and so the root you know, of all evil. You got to follow the dollars. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, they allowed him in and, uh, you know, uh, what President Carter thought actually happened. Okay. November 4th. So they storm the uh, the embassy. You When do you know something's wrong? Where, what are you doing at the time? When I'm walking into the motor pool gate to go out in town, because uh, we couldn't drive, you had to have a driver, I get this recall, recall. And again, like I said, there had been a demonstration every day for two weeks. I turned around and looked at the front gate, and Mike, they're coming over the wall, and there was no security outside the gate. Like one of those zombie movies where you was, just keep I mean, coming. I'm telling you, I will tell everybody I speak to, all your listeners, everybody, that that morning, November 4th, there were no security whatsoever. Wow. I ran back. I could run pretty fast back then. And I uh, got back into the Chancery, which was the main building, the 23-acre compound. Billy Gallegos, another Marine, was closing the door, saw me being chased. I squeezed in. We closed the door. And uh, we then donned our, our weapons. And and how much protection is inside the... Uh, the only thing I know is from zero dark 30 uh, as far as the embassy and it didn't look like they had much protection there yeah i, I can tell you the four inch steel doors were pretty well protected um, but uh, little did we realize um there was a window in the basement uh, but i can tell you the weapons that we had i'll give you a 20 dollar bill if you can guess what you think our weapons were so uh i i hear military i think m16 i think uh you know ar-15 i don't know what kind of weapon you know 1979 it was a snub nose 38 and sawed off shotgun are oh. you serious no no machine guns at all. No automatic Bob, weapons. Bob giving you guys weapons? Yeah. And so I can tell you that, um, you know, once you made it into that, that building, nobody was going to get in. Nobody was going to get out. And everybody was trying to make it to that building. Right. So many of the Americans that were working in the compound, they... They didn't get in. They were immediately taken. So seven Marines held that American embassy for the next four hours. Wow. Waiting for the host government. Stubbed those 38s and clubs. And, yeah. And, yeah. And so we basically had the building secured until in the basement, Billy Guy goes is downstairs. I'm at the front door and I'm watching the plaster fall from around the door. Wow. I mean, we're readying so in, to the, yeah. the government of Iran, you got to come and remove these people. I mean, this is not good. And all of a sudden the plaster starts falling and Billy's downstairs, another Marine, and he hears a loud noise, realizes they've broken in. And who do they bring in, Mike? The second thing I will never forget, and I will tell every American that morning, November 4th, who do the Islamic Republic of Iran bring in? But four Iranian women in black shadors and they use them as shields as the men are pushing them forward because they knew the mindset. And you and, and you, yeah, unbelievable. So uh, obviously you're not shooting the women? No. Uh, so what happened? Billy Radios, That's another reason why I couldn't be a Marine. Yeah, no, I just started no, shooting everybody. <laughs> we were, yeah, trust me, I, as I said, for the next 30 days, um, I regretted not ever pulling that trigger, yeah. Mike. I, I wanted them to feel the pain. But I run downstairs. Video, Billy had radio that they had broken in. Get down there. And it's Billy and I uh, basically facing off the four Iranian women in black shadows, And the men are pushing them forward. Get to the steps. Tear gas is released. They flee the building. We go up to the very top. We're stalling. Yeah. Waiting for Trying the Trying to wait government. for the, yeah. It's four hours into the whole ordeal. We blockade the door. Um, the State Department, our group is on horn with uh, President Carter. They start to bring Americans that didn't make it in, that uh, had been stripped their freedom. And I tell you, Mike, that the American flag, your listeners, un until you have been stripped your freedom, you have no idea how wonderful it is. And I can tell you that morning when President Carter told us to give ourselves up, that they would resolve this with diplomacy. It was the morning that uh, my freedom 
My uh-huh. dignity and my pride was stripped for the next 444 days. Sure, you. I mean, you're in the hands of somebody else. Your fate's being determined by a government that, that you know, by people that, that were just coming in to attack you. You don't know what's going to come out of that, no right. matter what you're assured of. You're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that a Muslim is not born with hatred. Yeah. They are taught hatred. And the day of November 4th, 1979, is the day that the war on terrorism started. The Islamic Republic of Iran has been teaching young to hate America and hate Jews ever since. Yeah. And every day, November 4th, every year, January 20th, they burn American flags oh. to teach that hatred. And, and so now you're you're there with how many people? Was it? So at that point in time, January of 1979, there were 20,000 Americans. Okay. It was a beautiful country. Yeah. I mean, so much history. And when I got there, there were 66 Americans, uh, a soul. And so that morning, November 4th, uh, yeah, there were about 60 of us that were taken. Right. And so we were, the first 30 days, uh, we were tied to a chair. Our arms were tied to the arms of the chair. Our feet were tied to the feet of the chair. Sometimes at night, they'd put you on the floor and tie your wrists to your ankles, and that's how you slept. And you're sitting there hoping and praying that there is negotiations going on. But I You have no contact. You So you were no. told, yes, but you don't know what's going on. No. And they're probably telling you the opposite. They're telling well, you what they want you to believe. Yeah, it, it was, uh, they start doing their interrogations. They wanted information. And out of the, the interrogations, one individual broke. Oh, really? And, and he sang like a bird. Really? Uh, went around. I'll never forget the day that he came into the room. As I was in that corner of the room, Sergeant Lopez was in that corner, Staff Sergeant Muller was in that room, and we're all facing the corner, and all of a sudden you heard this door open up, and couldn't see, and all of a sudden you heard this voice, and I recognized the voice, and I'm not going to give the name out to this uh-huh. individual. Uh, he's currently in prison right now, but this uh, individual says, yeah, that's Sergeant Lopez. And then he goes, that's Sergeant Sickman. He's one of the Marines. That's Staff Sergeant Muller. He's Just writing everybody out. And he's doing it for favors. Yeah. So when you, and this is 1979. I can tell you that training has gotten much better since yeah. 1979. Now they're able to find people that ha- are weak. Back then, we never had that type yeah, of training. Yeah, it was just everybody. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, what was his fate? At that, that thing, um, the... well, his, <laughs> I don't know, uh, because again, you just heard him, and so you never saw him again, right? Um, but you had heard that uh, this individual had been leaking information, so little did we re- know that the Islamic Republic of Iran they released all the women except for two, okay, and all the blacks except for one, Charles Jones, that was in the uh, communication vault. Um, but we had no idea that this was happening. Was Charles like, what did I do? <laughs> no, but Charles was in the communication vault, and uh, he didn't come out until later, so they right away suspected he was a, a CIA Something, guy. Something, yeah. Yeah, so, but, uh, I mean, that that first 30 days, I mean, I spent um, my first Thanksgiving. I mean, you like holidays, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I, I read <laughs> now, I, if you're not with your kids, or you're not with your family, you, you feel bad now, imagine sharing two that. Two Thanksgivings, in, two Christmases. Two, uh, 444 total days yes at what point i i i I don't know how else to say that at what point did you think that we're not getting out of this like how quick like in the first 30 days you might have thought it's still going on it must be almost over mike i tell you every day you didn't know if you were going to live or die yeah morning noon and night and um i spent my first thanksgiving tied to a chair uh first christmas and then i was put into a room about the size of your studio with two other people right for the next 400 days and uh billy gallegos that marine um that uh, i was telling you about and jerry platkin uh, jerry platkin was the only american civilian i mean there's a great story i, I was telling mike earlier about jerry he was he was a merchant he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oof. Jerry was from uh, the Bronx. Right. Uh, he was Jewish, and he was carrying a quarter million dollars in, in a briefcase that morning, November 4th. Wow. He was supposed to be in the visa building, which was on the backside. That morning, we're attacked. We say, hey, sir, back away. And he's with a Korean. Little did we realize that Jerry's business, his brother owned a, a, a headhunting service right. that hired Koreans to work the minefield. Jerry was to get his visa stamped over at the visa building, and he was to go to the airport. Wrong place, wrong time. Jeez. They released a Korean. They kept Jerry because he was Jewish, yeah. and he was carrying a quarter million dollars in cash. Wow. 